the banks and monetary policymakers and fiscal policymakers are playing this crucial role in terms of the bridge between a relatively healthy starting point and, and a future. Even if we were to get a vaccine or a major medical breakthrough, I do think that the focus of our society on being ready or for viruses and, in, and infectious diseases is, is here to stay. We work with teams across the world, with clients across the world, and I think it's extremely important to try to understand them and, and learn about their background. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Learning from Leader series. As always, I'm joined today by Peter Van Ams, uh, author of uh, the books Before I Was a CEO. And today, we have the immense pleasure to welcome Dan, Dan Straven, a senior economist at Goldman Sachs. Peter, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Luc, and good to see you again, everyone, at our next uh, installment of the Learning from Leaders uh, program and indeed we're so happy to welcome Don. Don who is a senior economist at Goldman Sachs who's a, a PhD in economics also from MIT really a top school to study uh, economics we'll get uh, back uh, to that topic in just a little bit uh, but Don first of all welcome of course and uh, for joining us and uh, I have to ask you how are you because you are of course joining us from one of those regions in the world that's been worst hit by the crisis, the public health crisis, that is, uh, of COVID-19. You are in New York, isn't that right? That's right. Uh, hi, Luke. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Uh, clearly, the New York area was uh, the hardest hit in the U.S. Um, the good news is that following an intense lockdown, the medical situation is improving uh, and the world is gradually reopening, at least here uh, in, the, in the New York area. Excellent. So uh, glad to hear that you're all right. I, I assume you're all right. You look uh, quite quite all right, and I know you have a, a family as well, uh, which uh, we uh, we assume are, is well. Um, now that that of course leads us then to a bigger question, right? Because uh, knowing that you're okay, we want to know, of course, the things that you look into are they okay? You look into the global economy. That's your specialization at Goldman Sachs, of course, the the, the well-known international internet investment bank. So we hear all these things. We hear the stock market going up and down, really almost like a casino. We see a public health crisis, which, you know, in some countries is, is, uh, is getting better. In other countries, it's still getting worse. I think in overall numbers, it's still increasing on a day-by-day -day basis. So what do you make of all this if you look at the economy? Sure. So we estimate that global GDP fell extremely sharply by about 17%, sort of between mid-January and mid-April. And based on the historical data we have, this is almost certainly the deepest uh, global recession we have seen since at least the Second World War. However, if you sort of define uh, a recession as a period where activity is declining, where output is falling, uh, this recession, which uh, presumably is the deepest since the Second World War, may already be over in the sense that the recovery has started. Um, in fact, we estimate that about half of this sort of 17% decline in global output that we saw at the peak has now been unwound as many economies reopen. Um, of course, uh, I think it's very important to uh, recognize that despite an improvement in activity, the level of activity remains very low, labor market slack remains very elevated, and unemployment rates remain very elevated. Uh, for instance, in the US, it's right that economists were surprised by the decline in the unemployment rate in May a couple of weeks ago, but the level of the unemployment rate remains very elevated, uh, around 13.5% or even 16% if you uh, account for misclassification. And to put things into perspective, uh, after the great financial crisis, the unemployment rate peaked at 10%. So we're still well above that, despite a very rapid sequential pace of improvement. And that's an image that you're seeing in many economies across the world, still very depressed activity, but quite rapid sequential improvement. Right. So that's uh, something at least I, I hear you say, well, things are indeed uh, rather bad, um, but it could be uh, that they can get better rather quickly as well in case 
uh, the I suppose the public health crisis improves. Right. Now, when when we look at the uh, financial sector, which is of course a sector that you're active in with the bank, you know, in the in the previous crisis, these were the bad guys, right? Uh, these were the ones that uh, uh, that uh, you know were all, were seen as being responsible for the financial crisis. Many banks also uh, had to be saved by governments and got into deep trouble. This time around, seems like night and day. What's happening? What's the role of the financial sector this time around? Yeah, sure. So, um, of course, we do expect some some losses in some asset classes, um, and banks do have some exposure. For instance, we are looking for for a pickup. Uh, in defaults among high yield companies or um, some losses in commercial real estate. However, taken together, despite the exposure of banks to these areas where, where we're expecting significant losses that are comparable to those in the financial crisis, overall, the banking system is definitely in a significantly better shape than during the great financial crisis. Um, and I think there, there are sort of three reasons for that. Um, first of all, coming into this recession, uh, households, especially in the U.S., but also in many other parts of the world, came into this uh, crisis with very healthy balance sheets, um, elevated saving rates, uh, at least in the aggregate, uh, and uh, relatively healthy uh, financial situations. Um, and because of a starter, uh, stronger starting point for the household uh, balance sheets, and because of very strong support of the government sector to households, uh, we expect that the losses in terms of mortgages, or, or consumer loans will be significantly smaller. And this, that's the biggest asset class that banks are exposed to. Um, second, banks, very much like households, enter this crisis in a healthier position with more elevated capital buffers, more elevated liquidity uh, positions. Uh, and finally, uh, a third sort of interesting reason is that uh, to a large extent during the great financial crisis, uh, there, there was a run on several banks as there were worries about the quality of their assets. What we saw now in March and April was actually that households did run towards banks. Households sold uh, risky assets. Uh, the saving rate in April surged to an all-time high. And so what happened is that uh, actually a lot of banks saw an increase in liquidity as households brought their cash to banks as opposed to taking it away from banks, which happened uh, with several banks during the great financial crisis. Right. So in overall a much more solid financial sector, it seems, uh, this time around, which will be necessary, of course, because there's a lot, a lot of debt that is uh, being piled up, both by companies, of course, who need credits to survive, by governments who just have to print money, it seems, just to keep everyone up and running. And then, of course, the banks play a crucial role uh, in making sure that that money gets to where it needs to go, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, the banking system uh, is, is part of the solution in, in, in this crisis. And I think more broadly, monetary policymakers are also playing a very important role by providing liquidity, by easing financial conditions, and by making sure that credit continues to flow to fundamentally healthy companies uh, and to households, which fundamentally, uh, as soon as the public health crisis is under control, should be, should be in, a, in a good position. So I think the banks and monetary policymakers and fiscal policymakers are playing this crucial role in terms of the bridge between a relatively healthy starting point and and a future which uh, you know, which which is hopefully bright once we control the public health crisis right so that's very important though now uh, you know still with all the help from the governments with all the help from the from the uh, banks you know a lot of companies are in dire straits aren't they we see a lot of bankruptcies a lot of uh, companies have to restructure get debt you know, if you uh, if you were in the position that you were running a company and you were, uh, you know, uh, you know, finding these these difficulties to even just survive, let alone uh, keep uh, employment up and keep revenues up, what what's your advice? What would you do uh, if you were uh, running a company right now? You know, we're still in the midst of this crisis, of course. Yeah, it's it, it's tough, and you know, I'm a macroeconomist, not running a, running a business. But what I can say that's happening with a lot of our clients is that. Initially, they were extremely focused on liquidity, making sure they had the cash to survive, and also protect, protect their employees. Uh, of course, the focus remains on protecting employees and consumers. Uh, but I think the shift is now focusing towards how do we bring our people back? How do we bring our consumers back? And then also, are there any new opportunities? Um, there's going to be some reallocation. Some sectors 
uh, are likely likely going to gain. Of course, some sectors are, are are going to be weaker until we have a medical breakthrough. But when I, for instance, look at uh, data on retail sales in the U.S. for the month of May, some areas are seeing stronger growth than before the crisis. E-commerce is an example. Building materials is another one. So I think a, a lot of companies are starting to try to identify the the opportunities that come along with this with this uh, very large economic and, and public health crisis. Yeah, those pockets of growth, those pockets of opportunity. And of course, in every crisis, uh, it leads to new opportunities and it will certainly lead to a different world uh, on the other side, if you will. Now, there are some very practical implications uh, for the people in our audience. Many, many people are, are about to graduate, are about to get into the labor market. And of course, they have to decide now, what am I going to do with my career? Where am I going to apply? Or should I perhaps just take another gap year uh, and uh, do some uh, personal uh, development and discover the world? What's your advice if you were graduating today? What, uh, what do you think you'd be doing? Yeah, so I would say the, the somewhat unfortunate uh, reality is that in prior recessions, uh, students graduating uh, in the midst of a, of a crisis and entering the labor market in those years did suffer from persistent income losses relative to peers who graduated in periods where the labor market was brighter. So that, that seems to be a strong empirical fact. So you know, how, do you, how do you respond, of course, respond, of course, as a student? Well, first of all, uh, you know, it's very important to be resilient and, and continue, continue to push for opportunities, even if it's just significantly harder. Second, it's probably also time to, to consider, is this a good time to invest in your skills? Maybe learn a new language, learn a new computer language, uh, maybe pick up another degree or a new skill. Uh, in a sense, the opportunity cost of learning is lower because the, the missed income that you would get through a normal job is lower. And then finally, I think, related to the pockets of growth you mentioned, um, it's also an opportunity to pivot. There are clearly areas that are growing. Uh, public health, medical equipment, e-commerce, redesigning our offices, redesigning our public transportation systems, home technology. There are areas of growth, uh, and those are opportunities for, for young people with, with good ideas. Absolutely. And surely we'll get back to that question, Dom, if you don't mind, we'll grill you a little bit more about uh, the questions that the students have later on in this conversation. But before we do, I, I want to shift gears because, of course, you're, uh, you're sitting in that seat where you're able to analyze the global economy uh, for a, a globally active bank, which is Goldman Sachs. A very fascinating job, no doubt. A very coveted job, of course, and, and not easy to get to. So uh, what I want to do is, and what we always do, is a little bit go back in time. Go back in time to when Don was uh, a little bit younger and perhaps uh, around the age of, uh, of many of the students now, or even uh, just a little bit before that. Um, and I want to start because you and I, of course, uh, there's a personal background story here. We know each other uh, since we were uh, young as well. I remember our bike trips that we did together uh, as uh, kids almost. Uh, but you come from, a, what, what, what can I say, you're fair to say, like sort of a middle class but intellectually rich family in a small Belgian town, uh, is that sort of your, your background? Fair to, fair to describe it that way? The town is definitely small and my parents uh, and, and family are, are, are very uh, loving and supportive and I, I think you know, intellectually rich, uh, for sure. The, um, I had a very happy childhood. Um, you know, spent a lot of time with our family uh, over meals, debating the world, uh, debating family topics, uh, politics, society, economics. Um, I owe a lot to my family and mentors. Um, you know, in addition to spending a lot of time talking about the world, we also do a lot of sports together. Uh, you were not the only one. I, I biked with uh, Peter. Uh, yes. And we, uh, we, we love traveling together um, and also, you know, get an opportunity to, to see the world. Um, right. And yes, uh, the town I'm from is relatively small, Tienen, but I'm proud of it, proud of my roots um, and, and still quite close to, to my childhood friends. No, it's, it's a question, of course, that's interesting for, for a lot of people in the audience, too, because, uh, you know, we don't all come from, you live in New York now, and you, you studied in Boston, and you, you worked in, in, or studied in Brussels, uh, big uh, international cities, but uh, we don't all come from there. And it's interesting to see how you got from that small town, I think 20, 30,000 people, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, that metropolis that is New York. Now, the first step along the way was to go and study. And after your high school, uh, you decided to do something which uh, not all too many people do, which is to go and study in a university where the language they, they thought in, which was French, uh, was not your, um, your language that you were schooled in or that you spoke at home. Why did you decide to, to do that, actually? Why did you decide to, to switch 
uh, let's say, the, the language uh, of, uh, of choice? Yeah, so I, I was looking for a challenge. Uh, and of course, as a, as a Belgian, as a Dutch-speaking native Belgian, I thought it was important to understand and speak uh, well the language of the other, other half of Belgium, which of course is also quite useful uh, in many other places uh, in the world. Um, it was, you know, the beginning was tough. I still remember the, those courses in, in law with a lot of jargon and, and complicated uh, vocabulary. And they were definitely harder, at least for me, uh, than the math and, and, and science classes, which are pretty much the same in all languages. Um, and so yeah, I reached out to friends to help me. And my dictionary was probably also my best friend during the exam period, uh, at least in, uh, in the first year. Yeah, I can imagine. But you made it through. And, and after you, you did your studies, which you know, were commercial engineering, as they call it in, in Belgium or in, in Western Europe, um, you decided not to go and uh, work, which you could have done. I think you did internships at various places. I, I remember you went to the World Bank in Washington. You went to a, an investment advisor in Belgium and, uh, and perhaps even a consulting firm. I think McKinsey was one of the, the companies that, that, that liked to hire you. Uh, but you went to study some more. Uh, you went to do a, a PhD in economics. Why uh, not just get into the labor market? Why not just go and work? Why, why continue to study? Yeah. Um... It was not because we were we were also in a financial crisis when I when I graduated. That was that was not the main reason. Um, the main reason was that it was a big challenge, and I felt like that I had to strengthen my technical foundations to understand the global economy, to understand the world, and ultimately um, have more opportunities in terms of sort of the the private sector, um, academic and and policy jobs uh, that I would uh, you know, eventually hope to hope to engage in uh, and then you know it was of course also very exciting from a personal perspective to move across the Atlantic build a, a second new life uh, and in some way you know to to try to pursue the American dream yeah and that's and you touched upon that right there but and you talk about it very quickly as if it's nothing but you know that was a big jump wasn't it you went from Brussels in Belgium uh, to Solvay School which is an excellent school of course uh, but you went to the number one Institute in the world uh, to study economics, which is uh, MIT. I think various Nobel Prize winners went there, uh, if I'm not mistaken. People like Paul Krugman and many others uh, studied there. Many chief economists from the world. Back. I mean, like this is really a very special place. How do you get in at MIT to do a PhD in economics? What, what's the secret? Was there a mentor? Was it just you being brilliant? I mean, like, how do you uh, demystify this? Yeah, so in addition to, to meeting the academic uh, credentials. I think the support from, from my mentor at the University of Brussels, Mathias de was critical. Mathias is a world-class economist, has a PhD in Harvard uh, himself, was a visiting professor at MIT for, for decades. Um, and when we worked uh, on my master thesis on Belgian labor market policies, uh, it clicked. I fell in love with economics research and he believed in me and he supported me. And that definitely uh, was uh, instrumental in getting uh, accepted uh, at uh, at MIT uh, PhD, and I'm still very grateful uh, today uh, to him. We're still in touch, and you know, a couple of weeks ago we were, we we're on a Zoom discussing our latest work on the impact of the Corona crisis on the economy. Uh, so yes. yeah, I'm very grateful for uh, for that relationship. But a crucial a crucial building block, isn't it? Because of course you succeeded, and 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 you sort of spread your wings, and and you showed you could fly. Um, but perhaps without that mentor, without that missing link, if you will, it would have been a different story. Yeah, he has been instrumental, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's something that we often forget when we tell sort of our leadership stories is that, it, that often behind that leader or behind that person, uh, there's often a whole supporting team. You talk about your family, you talk now about your, um, uh, your mentor at, uh, at, at Solvay. Uh, and then, of course, you had to do it yourself. You had to prove that you were capable of uh, not just the economics, but that you said it was not the hardest part because, you know, you can do it in French, you can do it in English, you can do it in Dutch or any other language. At the end of the day, the math is the math. Uh, but you also have to make a huge cultural change when you, of course, move to a country like the United States. How was that for you? Any, any particular anecdotes that stuck with you? Yeah, it was, it was exciting um, and very rich. But um, it was also hard, frankly. I think what's the hardest is just the distance from, from your family and friends. You know, I, it's a little bit like the lockdown period now. We all miss those high-frequency, face-to-face uh, interactions. Um, and I think the, the distance is particularly hard uh, 
when you need your support system, when life is a little bit tougher. Um, I think many, many students who do research uh, or do a PhD can, can sympathize with this, but the PhD or the research process more broadly is sort of a marathon. It's an up and down. And when we are at the down, having this support system is very important. And so, you know, Skype, Skype, Skype was definitely uh, my motto during much of the, the PhD. Uh, and of course, also building a local support system, uh, friends. Uh, I met my wife, Lynn, also in Boston, who was a student there as well. And I think another time when it's difficult to be away is sort of when your friends and family go through sort of the milestones in their life, get married, get a baby, something happens in the family. And, and that can be tough, but I, you know, I always try to puzzle and, and plan my work um, and, and uh, study vacations around those milestones uh, of, uh, of friends and family. To be there right. when it's and and, uh, and and you made it through. That's that's clear. And as you say, I mean, we're going to talk about uh, how you then landed or ended up at Goldman Sachs. But you mentioned your wife, so I want to perhaps uh, talk about uh, her and and your family life as well. Because I mean, you're one of those people, of course, where millennials uh, were were um, both man and 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 wife. In your case, uh, highly successful people, and of course, uh, more than fully. Uh, active on the, on the job market. You have, I think, also uh, a little family, uh, one or two, a uh, second on the way, I believe. And yeah, four, uh, 9. The, uh, one point nine. The coming in, in two weeks. Yeah. In two weeks. So, uh, so almost there. And okay. so, it's one of the questions that then we need to ask. So, isn't it? Is like, how do you combine, uh, you know, uh, that work and life, especially if both of you are uh, so uh, highly successful? Of course, at work, but you have a, a whole family at home as well. Yeah, so first of all, I think I got very lucky by meeting Lynn, who's very organized, supportive, and intellectually my peer, or I'd say at least my peer. And to be honest, you know, there's no perfect balance. It's hard. You need to prioritize. You need to say no um, sometimes. And, and what helps me is just to carve out time, uh, good chunks of the weekend to plan fun activities with, uh, with the family, um, do it together and commit to it. There will always be an email to respond to a research project to work on. So I think. It's, it's important to, to block that time. And frankly, this lockdown has uh, been good for me and my daughter. Uh, we definitely played a lot of soccer uh, during my work breaks um, because we're all together in the same house 24, 24 seven. Uh, and seeing her during the day has definitely been a, been a good thing. It's uh, clearly been an upgrade from the days that you and I played soccer together. Uh, I'm sure your, uh, your daughter will soon uh, put us both to I'll, shame I'll her skills. Me. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, but of course you did succeed also not just in being a dad and uh, and and a husband but also in in uh, in being a, a very strong professional. And uh, you uh, after your PhD you decided to uh, to then do go and work for a company and that's the company you're still with, which is Goldman Sachs. Now, uh, when it was perhaps at first uh, you know a, a, a question you know am I going to study a PhD or am I going to the labor force? You know once you are successful uh, and you are an economist. You know, a lot of people will build an economic career. Why did you then decide uh, after that PhD yet to, uh, to, to go and work for a company, to go and work for a bank and become an economist there? Yeah, so I, I definitely considered uh, working at some, some top, top business schools. Um, in the end, I uh, went for, for the, the research group at Goldman and uh, very much enjoyed my work. I think the, the, presumably the most important factor here is that I can work on a broad range of pressing topics, really the topics that policymakers and clients uh, are focused on uh, right now. Um, and, and the breadth uh, of, of topics is just quite intellectually stimulating. And then I would say the, the people component is also quite key, um, both internally, we work in teams all the time, and also externally, serving, serving clients, interacting with them, traveling when it's possible to, to talk about the, the economy with them. It's just something I enjoy and that gives me more energy. Is that something that you knew at the time? Because, of course, uh, you know, you, you didn't know your colleagues yet. So, what, you know, did you sort of do your, I'm sure you did some due diligence uh, being a, a researcher and an economist, um, or did you just go with your gut feeling? I mean, like, did you have people around you that said, oh, you know, I, I do this or I do that. I, I, I go to Goldman because there's good people there. How, how did that go, that decision process? Yeah, so I think I spent quite a bit of time with the future colleagues. Um, made a lot of lists of, of the arguments in favor and arguments against, but in the end, uh, in the end, prim you know, after having talked to a lot of people and gone through the arguments, in the end, I, I went mostly with my, my gut feeling and just my intuition that I'm 
I'm happy in an environment where you can work at a relatively fast pace on, on a broad range of topics. I mean, a, an interesting insight, a takeaway for me right there, that even the most brilliant economist uh, and, and best mathematician at the end of the day will go for his gut feeling. But uh, Dan, um, I, I want to ask you now, of course, you've been there for a couple of years, I think more than uh, five or so uh, at the organization. And, and obviously, uh, moving through the, the ranks of, of the organization seems to be going uh, quite well. Um, but surely the skill set that you had at the beginning, which was, I suppose, mostly analytical, has evolved over time. Could you tell us a little bit about that evolving skill set that you need to, uh, to succeed and thrive at, a, at, a, at an organization like uh, Goldman Sachs and how you manage to gain those skills uh, over time? Yeah, so I think at the beginning, and it continues to be important, uh, being highly analytical and, and careful with data and careful with the analysis is the most important part. Over time, you evolve. I think it becomes more important to figure out what are the most important questions that our clients uh, want to know the answer to. And I think you, know, you, you can get to those by reading, thinking, brainstorming, taking a step back, uh, talking to people. Um, in addition to sort of the importance of figuring out the right questions and topics, it also becomes quite important to lead a team, uh, inspire them, um, and, and speak to senior senior clients. And I think there, there's it's not rocket science. It's learning by doing and, and getting continuous feedback uh, along the way. Yeah, uh, very important, of course. And and uh, seems like you're you're doing really well. The last question I want to ask you before we we turn to questions from the students, because there's many uh, that have some questions for you. But I think you also have been able to to work on your cultural. IQ, isn't it? Uh, I mean, of course, you have moved from Europe to the U.S. And then, as you briefly mentioned, uh, you met your wife. I think your wife, uh, Lin, uh, originally from China. Your children, I think, if I'm correct, will be learning Mandarin or already speaking Mandarin, perhaps. Um, right. And, of course, you speak uh, several languages as well. So how do you uh, gain uh, a cultural IQ? Uh, and how important do you say uh, is it, uh, including at your work? Yeah, so you know, learning Mandarin is definitely a humbling experience. I think <laughs> at this point, I think my daughter, our daughter, who's two years old, and I probably know the same number of words in Mandarin, but she the, the gap will widen very quickly. Um, <laughs> another conversation topic we love is sort of trying to figure out what can we learn from different cultures. What sort of the cocktail you want to make? Uh, you know, when we travel to Asia to visit family. I'm always impressed by sort of the respect and love for the elderly. Um, Europe's social safety net is just very powerful, especially when you get hit by those big shocks right now. And the reason I'm in the U.S. presumably is just uh, the you know pretty unparalleled opportunities you get in in, in schools and and sort of the business business world. And it's very important at work, uh, work with teams across the world, with clients across the world. And I think it's extremely important to try to understand them. And, and learn about their background. Um, but I think you, you don't necessarily need to work in a multinational company to get that. Traveling helps. It might uh, be going live, hang on. Environment. Uh, who are your diverse peers uh, with the different backgrounds that you can learn from? Um, yeah, so I, I, th I think it's very important. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, and, and clearly you're, uh, you, you, you've gotten there. You know, I wanna turn now, if that's okay, down to a couple of questions from uh, students who have been filing in uh, with their questions online uh, while you were speaking. Uh, but first, I want to turn, if that's okay, to Leo Yue, um, who is also uh, from uh, China originally, who is now in Munich with EU Business School. And uh, she has a question, I think, around the topic that you, uh, you're you probably well aware of, which is the U.S.-China relations uh, going forward. Uh, Yue, go ahead. Just wait for you it to come online. Hello, can you see me? Absolutely, go ahead, you it. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. Um, my name is Liu Yu, I'm from China. I'm uh, really honored to take this opportunity to ask this question. It is uh, about the US and China. Uh, well, what happened between the US and China and has greatly affected the global economy. How do you think about the future relations between the two countries and uh, what will be the future effect on the um, global economy? Yeah, um, 
thank you for that very important question. Um, clearly, the US-China trade tensions uh, were a key reason why the global economy slowed down last year um, because of the decline in trade volumes, but even more importantly, the uncertainty that, that is created and also the negative impact uh, on financial markets. Um, however, I think it's also useful to keep sort of the magnitudes in perspective. We think that the hit to the peak hit to quarterly growth uh, from the corona crisis is about 60, six zero times larger than the impact of the, of the trade war. Um, nevertheless, it's very important that the phase one trade deal uh, remains uh, intact. Um, and I think that the news we got overnight um, suggesting that um, China will increase agricultural purchases, which are sort of a key component of the phase one trade deal, um, after Chinese officials met with the U.S. State Secretary Pompeo. I think that news uh, is encouraging. Um, our baseline policy forecast for, for, the, uh, for the economy uh, expects the trade deal to remain in place. Uh, we think it would be uh, quite costly in such a, a difficult economic environment. Um, both in the US uh, and to some extent also China to sort of re, uh, re-escalate the trade war um, when, uh, when the economic situation uh, is tough. Now, looking ahead, you know, which is what your question is getting at, it's very hard to know how the US-China relationships will evolve. What I can say is that we already seen in the trade data that you see some shifts in supply chains, um, trade volumes uh, from uh, China to the US have declined over the last year, even when the trade news got better. And some companies, sorry, some countries, including Vietnam, Bangladesh, Mexico, saw an increase uh, in exports to the US in areas where tariffs were imposed. So suggesting that companies and countries are trying to adjust, diversify their supply chains, and presumably the corona crisis has um, emphasized the importance of uh, supply chain diversification for instance, in an area such as medical, medical equipment. So it's hard to forecast, but I suspect that this trend towards uh, supply chain diversification that was uh, already underway before we started the corona crisis will, uh, will likely continue. And uh, maybe we can ask you, this is an interesting topic, I think. Uh, you, uh, you had a second question that's related to this one, I believe, uh, which was around globalization. Uh, isn't that right? Um, my second question, you mean? Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah. Yes. Well, that uh, about globalization, and well, it was one of the uh, results of uh, the economic development. So um, I really want to know if it's going to be uh, um, slow down after this virus pandemic. Right. Um, that's a big question. Uh, globalization is, of course, a very broad concept. I think it can be useful to unpack it. Um, with, you know, I think of globalization as uh, trade flows, tourism flows across countries, financial flows across countries, flows of knowledge, uh, of communication. And I think there are definitely areas where, at least over the next couple of years, globalization will, will go down. Uh, and I think until we have a vaccine and a medical breakthrough, I think it's very reasonable to expect that the level of international travel will remain below the pre-virus level. And so that component of, of globalization is likely to, 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 to be weaker. Now, in terms of uh, technology flows, trade flows, financial flows, it's a, it's a, little, a little less clear. And diversification of supply chains in terms of trade does not necessarily mean that global trade volumes are going to go down. It could just mean that countries reorganize their flows, that new regional blocks uh, emerge. Um, and that, for instance, countries that I talked about earlier, like, like for instance, Vietnam or Bangladesh, could potentially see, uh, see a pickup. Um, but some decoupling um, and some diversification in terms of the US-China relationship um, seems, seems, seems quite possible. But Very that well, thanks. not necessarily mean deglobalization, I think. Right. No, and that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, a second topic that I think we want to address on that front, uh, Don, uh, is sort of the impact uh, of COVID on uh, developing countries. Um, and we've got Jeffrey with us, uh, Jeffrey Idean, uh, who's in Lagos, Nigeria. And he'd like to ask you about the impact and the consequences, I think, of the COVID crisis on developing countries. Jeffrey, are you able to join us? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? 
Go ahead. Well. Nice oh, yeah, so then thank you. I think uh, we've had a very inspiring session. Thank you for sharing like um, a whole global view, both your marriage, your education, and how you started. I think it's been very insightful. So um, there's been this push for digitalization, globalization, and, you know, as part of the processes for people to, you know, cope with the whole COVID situation. But however, in Africa, probably take, for example, like Kenya, where people depend on tourism as a huge part of the macroeconomy. You have people whom all the noise, like taking care of the animals, feeding the lions, and it's a whole supply chain process on who takes care of these, who is this. And these are not something you can digitalize. So, and it's, and it's come like overnight where people have not got enough time to prepare for. So what do you think these countries can do to, um, to improve their economy, not to get um, below how bad is it and how, what strategies can they employ to start steering the economy into the right direction this COVID period? Yeah, it's very tough. Uh, I think the idea that uh, more vulnerable uh, pockets of the global economy, countries, people are hit harder uh, than the higher income uh, areas is, is, is very important and very true. I mean, Within countries, for instance, uh, you know, taking the example of the U.S. or, or Europe, um, you know, about 35 to 40 percent of the work can be done from home, but it's primarily higher income uh, earners' uh, luxury. Um, people who work in the tourism sector that you identify, restaurants, uh, the service sector that requires a face-to-face -face interactions, obviously don't have that that luxury. Um, so, so what can they do? Um, I think it's it's of course first of all extremely important to continue to put a lot of public resources into fighting the virus. Um, economists and medical uh, experts estimate that the return on investment from investing in testing, investing in contact tracing, uh, is just, just tremendous. Um, and I think to the extent that those countries are able to uh, control the virus, it, it will also facilitate the, the return of, of the service sector and of, and of tourism. Um, but it, it's tough, I think, in the meantime, uh, what's, what also makes this challenging for many emerging markets is that it's harder for governments uh, and central banks to respond strongly. They have less fiscal room. It can be more difficult for central banks to lower interest rates because that creates uh, exchange rate issues. So, uh, you know, it is challenging, um, but I do think that long run, I, I do think that the demand uh, and the benefits from globalization for for emerging markets will will remain intact. Uh, Kenya is, is such a beautiful country. I I do I do believe that you know in four or five years, when it's highly likely we'll have a medical breakthrough, people will go there to visit. Uh, exposure to uh, manufacturing and exposure to uh, you know trade in the services sector. Think about um, think about the the, uh, the telecom sector, for instance, in India have been important engines of growth. Uh, and once we're through this, through this phase that we need to bridge with policy support and public health investments, once we're through this period, I do, I do think that those um, you know, recipes of, of growth will, will remain strong. Very well, thank you, uh, Don. And, and perhaps a, a final question on that uh, uh, topic of the impact, the economic impact, perhaps also the recovery. Uh, before I ask that question, I, I get a note here from the uh, video team if we could uh, take back a little bit our, our screen, perfect, so we can see all of you. Um, so the question is really about uh, recovery. Um, you know, many people are asking this. You know, Leopold is asking this, Tushar is asking this, um, Daniel Kiroga is asking this. You know, everyone wants to know what is this recovery going to look like? Is it going to be a V shape? Is it going to be an L shape? Is it going to be a W? Is it going to be another letter of the alphabet or something entirely else? And and perhaps to give a, a you know a, a helpful answer to that. What do you think is going to be the most helpful strategy, be it from central banks or from governments, in order to make sure that whatever recovery it is, there is going to be a recovery? Yeah. Um, so far, the recovery in the countries where the public health situation is under control um, has a lot of properties of a V, um, meaning a very sharp decline and a quick initial rebound. However, uh, we expect that the pace of progress 
will slow and it will ultimately look uh, something in between a V and perhaps more realistically a, a 90 switch or, or a square root, meaning that initially the pace of progress is fast, but afterwards you continue to make progress at a slower pace. Um, why is that? I think that the fundamental reason that the initial recovery is fast is that policy support has been strong. Fiscal policymakers have provided a lot of disposable income through unemployment benefits, wage subsidies, uh, to support uh, households and to support consumption. And second, uh, I think we're learning, and I think China has been leading the way, that in some sectors, um, it is less challenging to bring activity back while controlling the virus. Think about manufacturing, think about commercial construction. In those sectors, if you uh, adapt your work protocols, use mass social distancing, you can bring activity back quite quickly. However, there are sectors where this is much more difficult. We were talking about travel in the case of Kenya, entertainment, um, sports events, there will be much harder. And I think uh, there, you know, we're not going to go back to normal levels until you have a medical breakthrough. And so the slower pace of those sort of second group of sectors we think will, will cause the sort of initial V to, to look somewhat more like a, a Nike, Nike, uh, Nike swoosh. The Nike swoosh, uh, sort of the, uh, longer shape. It's a very interesting uh, comparison. I wonder what else we'll be able to come up with in the in the future. But uh, I certainly like that image of a Nike swoosh. You know, uh, Don. Also, uh, you know, looking a little bit further ahead, uh, if we do get to that recovery, Tione, who is based in Stockholm, is asking a question online. You know, what are those long-term impacts of this crisis? Because of course, you talked about sort of how industries recover. Some recover very quickly. Some recover somewhat slowly um, but of course there's going to be entirely new industries there's going to be whole kinds of uh, new activities that are going to be emerging and otherwise we're going to be disappearing what are some of those long-term impacts that you're expecting and i have to ask again because we really love to see more, more of you if you can uh, lean back a little bit thank you Perfect. Um, in terms of the the long-run trends um, that we're going to see as a result of this crisis it's hard to know but i think in terms of the macroeconomic trends, um, I would think about, and I, I defend, identify two. I think the first one uh, is the very strong uh, role of fiscal policy and uh, the comfort of fiscal policymakers to respond very aggressively. The global fiscal response has been around 10% of GDP in just a couple of, of months, uh, whereas during the great financial crisis, which lasted several years, the response was quite a bit smaller. And so I do not I do think if we get hit by a, a big uh, um, or intermediate sized recession, again, unfortunately, maybe in 10 or 15 years, I think that's here to stay. Um, I think a second macro trend that, um, that is likely to remain in place, at least for the next few years, uh, is low interest rates. Um, and it's, it's um, you know, it, it, interest rates were already low coming into coming into this, uh, this, uh, this crisis. Um, several countries had already adopted negative interest rates. You know, think about Japan or the Euro area. Uh, but now the Fed, um, the UK, and a lot of emerging markets have also brought their interest rates essentially to, to zero. Um, and as long as inflation remains weak, um, and as long as uh, unemployment rates remain elevated, there will be uh, very large incentives for central banks to, to keep pushing, keep interest rates low. And I do think that that's uh, supportive of the economy. And I think it has, has some you know, quite significant effects on the real economy as well. When I just look at the housing sector data across the world, they're actually quite strong. In many countries, the level of real estate activity is now already back or above the pre-corona crisis level. And that's because housing through mortgages is just extremely sensitive to, to low, low interest rates. So I think this trend of low interest rates is here to stay unless the inflation yeah. process changes. And it's also those very high, very low interest rates, which in turn make it easier and less dangerous for fiscal policymakers to respond very strongly. So I think those two big macro policy trends are, are related. They are related and interreact. Now, of course, in the middle of those two, I suppose, uh, in a way, is the financial system and the financial sector, uh, which you are a part. Uh, people like Bart are asking also, you know, what do you think the role of the financial sector in general be, uh, will be going forward? Somebody else is asking, 
a similar question about the future of finance. Now, of course, big question, lots of possible answers. Uh, but what is for you one of the big takeaways of the COVID crisis, working in the financial sector and looking forward? Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's definitely a big question. I think conceptually, the, the two most important roles for the financial system, or the three most important roles, I think, are uh, providing uh, liquidity to, to households and firms uh, when necessary. I think they have done that together with the support of, of governments and central banks. Second, and that's going to be harder, um, is sort of identifying the projects and the companies that um, you know, will, will be uh, healthy uh, and need strong support and need to go through this tough period. And that may become harder if indeed we're going to see some reallocation and structural declines in some sectors and structural increases in other sectors. So that, that's, I think, a big challenge for financial markets and banks, uh, banks more, more broadly. Um, and, then, and then finally, I think the third role of the financial system is to help households to save. Um, in, in, in a smart and uh, diversified way. And I think this corona crisis has just shown how, uh, you know, how quickly asset prices can move and how important it is for the financial system to, to help households to, to manage, manage their savings in, in the best, best possible way. Um, yeah. And I presume that the digitization we're seeing now, I think at Goldman Sachs at some point in the New York office, 99% of the team was working from home. I think the, the trends towards a more digital finance uh, world is, is going to accelerate. It was already underway, but it's, it's going to accelerate. And, and no doubt this is true, not just in the financial sector, but in so many other sectors that move to digitization. We see it right here. I see you online. We could have met, of course, on campus, and we might still meet on campus in the future, I hope so, uh, or somewhere else in, in, in real life, but certainly embracing that digital uh, transition. You know, so before we get to another question from uh, um, a student live, Harsirat will ask a question next. I want to just ask this question that came from Kanaka, who I believe is based in India. And he's asking, well, okay, so I understand what the consequences are on the sectors that you talked about. If you look at the industries, industrial sectors, um, what do you think are some of the big industrial sectors that are going to come out winning? from this crisis are going to come out stronger. You mentioned, I think, construction uh, or, or, or related to activities uh, already once, but what are other big industries do you see coming out on top of this crisis? Yeah, uh, that's a fascinating question. I, uh, I do think this crisis shows the importance of public health policies, um, medical equipment, and, and sort of the whole medical sector, I think, is getting, getting a big boost. Um, and I also think that society's willingness to invest in public health and in the healthcare system definitely got a big boost. And I think it's, it's probably here to stay. So that's, I think, a very uh, important area. A second broad area is related to digitization, uh, e-commerce, home technology, um, you know, home deliveries for restaurants and, and other services. Um, and then presumably a third area of growth has to do with uh, how are we going to redesign our spaces, the spaces where we live, the spaces where we work, how we commute, um, how can we make the New York subway system um, virus compatible? I think that will, that will require a lot of uh, good insights from, from people working in, working in that area. But that means, Don, that you think that the virus is going to be with us for a very long time, doesn't it? Because you're talking about long-term impacts on industries. That means that, you know, based on the virus, when we heard a couple of months ago, we're going to have a, a vaccine within 12 to 18 months. Is that then perhaps uh, overly optimistic that it's going to be gone in uh, 12 to 18 months? It's tough. And, you know, the question also is how do you define long run? Um, and even if we were to get a vaccine or a major medical breakthrough, I do think that the focus of our society on being ready for, for viruses and, in, and infectious diseases is, is here to stay. Um, and one quite interesting research finding that we, we found is that countries that, uh, that got a significant uh, SARS exposure in 2003, and SARS, of course, was from a whole other scale than the coronavirus, those countries often did a much better job in responding to the corona crisis. And so it, it countries in like Asia, East Asia, Singapore, China. Singapore. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, that's right. Hong Kong in, in, the, in Americas. Uh, Canada is doing uh, quite well relative to the U.S. and uh, the Toronto area 
uh, had, a, had a significant local, local SARS outbreak in 2003. So, so it looks like that the experience of a virus has positive persistent effects in terms of how ready societies are. And so even if we get a vaccine, I think some of these, these, uh, these trends are, are here to stay. Yeah. Well, really uh, interesting uh, to see that there is some silver lining, at least from uh, having gone through that previous experience of SARS. Of course, also MERS, a similar coronavirus that was uh, with us a couple of years ago. I want to turn now uh, to Harsirat uh, Don. Uh, Harsirat, uh, who's uh, from India, who's studying in Barcelona, and who has, I think, uh, a question that's a little bit more related, again, um, uh, to your job and your career uh, at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Harsirat, uh, why don't you uh, ask that question? question is like Goldman Sachs is you know a dream, a dream company for many uh, students and many people so I want to ask you like what is the major skill set that the company took from the candidates especially during this time and what challenges would be there in future while hiring a candidate so like for the recent graduates what it advice would you give? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Arsirat, for, for this question. I think it's really a mix of strong hard skills and strong soft skills. Um, we continue on the hard side, we continue to look for uh, you know, computer scientists, programmers, uh, engineers to, to help us to digitize uh, the business further to, to serve, serve our clients, to analyze data sets that are getting bigger and bigger. Um, so I think uh, you know that that particularly is a is a big area in demand, uh, and, and and Python is becoming increasingly uh, you know the, the the programming language that that everybody uh, in in technical areas in the in the firm is uh, is using and speaking. Um, in addition to data analysis and programming and hard skills, I think soft skills are uh, you know at least as important. Um, you know you can have very uh, strong analytical solutions, but in the end you want to listen to your clients, you want to understand them, you want to build, maintain, and strengthen long-run relationships uh, of trust to, to implement uh, those technological and financial solutions uh, for, for your clients. So I think it's really the, the combination of the hard and the soft that, uh, that we're looking for and uh, opens up uh, you know, very exciting career paths. Excellent. Thanks so much, Don, for that uh, answer. And I got to say, there's a lot of questions from uh, students, as you might expect, uh, who are wondering about, you know, that career and how you best prepare for a career in finance. Well, you look good after a number of years of having worked for a bank, so I assume uh, you would recommend it to others as well to give it a, sh a shot. Uh, you know, what, what are some of the other things uh, that you think are, are good uh, preparations uh, for a job in banking and finance? Also, by the way, when you're a student, when some, uh, you know, one person is asking, Nitasha is asking, well, you know, am I assuming now that you probably didn't have a student life? when you were doing your PhD in economics because you were just working so hard and studying so hard. Um, what are some of the, uh, uh, you know, things that we can do uh, being students right now to prepare for a job in finance? Is it just about uh, learning and uh, sitting behind your computer all day or are some other uh, aspects that, that we can do? I think it's more than that. Uh, and it relates to the, the prior discussion we had. It's also about soft skills. And I don't think you, you pick them up by, by studying only. I also think you pick them up by uh, you know, through through social life and through uh, you know hobbies and, and traveling. So I think that's a good part of it. It was definitely a lot of hard work, but I think you know also sometimes need to recharge the batteries uh, and, and and take breaks. Um, and my my more generic advice, rather than what helps you in finance, I think is just to uh, when you're young, figure out what you're passionate about, and and it's okay to experiment. It's okay to pivot. Um, you know we. Uh, or, or life expectancies is very elevated. Uh, and so we'll have long careers. And so that, that means that you, you have time to experiment and figure out exactly the best match between what makes you tick and, um, and, and the opportunities out there. Very well. And I suppose uh, studying uh, finance uh, is not a bad uh, start. I know a lot of uh, the students here are minoring or majoring in finance or considering to do so in the future. Uh, that seems still like a safe bet uh, going forward, would you say? I think fundamentally the, the sort of key uh, tasks of the financial sector will uh, are, are here to stay. Uh, providing liquidity, identifying good opportunities for entrepreneurs, and helping households to save. This is here. This is going to stay here. 
um, of course, the way we organize finance is already changing and will continue to change. Um, but fundamentally, uh, you know, the, the the mission of finance has been there for for centuries and, and is here. To and it's going to be there for a while. You know, turning back perhaps in the last five minutes that we have with you, Dom, uh, to uh, some uh, questions on the pandemic, because that's really on everyone's minds as well. Uh, you know, Zlata, for example, is asking this question, which I think we all have, which is, is there going to be a second wave? Are we already seeing a second wave? Or, you know, is this still the first wave that's getting worse and worse? You know, what, what's, your, what's your feeling on this? Yeah, it's of course, uh, I think the most important question for the economic outlook. And while we look for uh, a sequential strong recovery, uh, the possibility of a major reacceleration infectious infections creates a lot of downside risk. Together, I think, with a potential weakening in fiscal support, those are the two biggest downside risks. On the upside case, if we get a vaccine quicker than expected, you could also see a, a very strong and, uh, and, and more quick and quicker than expected recovery. Now, we are not epidemiologists, but I would say that our economic baseline forecast is consistent with um, virus control that allows uh, many activities to gradually recover. Um, how likely is a second wave? It's tough. A lot, of, a lot of medical experts worry about it. They point to the fact that prior coronaviruses were, were often seasonal uh, and you often got a second wave. Uh, point to potential weather effects or the, the idea that when you go back indoors, infection risk rises. Um, on the other hand, as an economist, I'm very focused on the behavioral response from individuals and policymakers. And the, the following empirical observation is important. Uh, I think most places in the world that got hit very hard in the first wave are seeing an improving virus situation. And that to me suggests that policymakers and individuals uh, have turned more cautious. Um, mask wearing in the New York subway, uh, the fact that super spreading events like, like, like indoor sports stadiums or indoor concerts are still restricted. Um, and I, I, I do think if we, we can uh, sort of maintain uh, a good chunk of this behavioral response that uh, you know, it, it is plausible and it's our baseline that we'll not see uh, a, major, uh, a major second wave. Now, globally, Weeks. the number of new cases is still rising. But that's mostly, I would say, new first waves rather than a second wave. Yeah. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and, of course, work very hard, as you say. It's also up to our behavior, as you said it, uh, to make sure that it, the, it doesn't uh, get worse. You know, to end, really, two questions that are perhaps a little bit more niche. Let's see if you, uh, if you can answer them uh, from uh, students. I wanted to put them in front of you, one from Tatenda in Zimbabwe and one from Julian in Colombia. Uh, financial questions. You know, Tatenda asks, you know, we are seeing now sort of uh, uh, investors such as Ray Dalio and other uh, economists plead for, for example, debt forgiveness for poor countries uh, that are highly indebted as a way to get out of this crisis because otherwise they might never. Um, Julian is uh, looking at the mic microeconomic aspects of it and he says, you know, what, what we're seeing here in Colombia, some proposals uh, of inverse mortgages, meaning you know, if some people can't pay their mortgages anymore, why don't you allow somebody else to pay off the mortgage, for example, a younger family, and then when uh, uh, things play out, uh, you know, both sort of win, uh, one wins by uh, being able to live in their house, and the other one wins by having the, the, the right to live there when the, uh, the other person dies. What do you think of, of, of these, uh, the one very macro, the other very micro, um, what do we think of debt forgiveness and inverse mortgages? Yeah. These are great questions. Uh, I think at the high level, what I can say is that it's very important to be uh, creative and open-minded about these kind of solutions, uh, primarily because this is truly what economists love to call an exogenous shock. Uh, typically, the argument uh, in favor of debt forgiveness is that that helps companies or businesses to stay afloat and that supports the economy. The argument against is that it's moral hazard. You incentivize those countries or, or households to borrow more uh, or, or banks to behave in a somewhat riskier manner in the future. Today, with this cause being a virus, which is truly uh, an exogenous shock, I think that argument, that moral hazard argument against creativity around debt, I think is, is weaker. So uh, I think there are, uh, overall, I think those ideas need to be considered very carefully. Very well done. And I guess we'll uh, answer that question on inverse mortgages uh, offline when uh, we have more time. Because, of course, 
we are uh, in part a Swiss business school. We want to end things on time. And I see our mm -hmm. hour is almost up with about 30 seconds to go. So from my side, Don, what a tremendous pleasure to talk to you again, to see you again, and to hear you spread your wisdom with all of the students and the alumni uh, from the school. So thank you so much, Don. And then I'd like to turn back over to Luc for a final word of conclusion. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, for, for all your contribution and insight. Uh, I think it has been a quite active session with a lot of questions and, and uh, you have come up with a lot of answers to our students. So immense thanks for that. Uh, next for us, for the Learning from Leader series, is next week already uh, with uh, Zev Siegel, the co-founder of Starbucks. Um, make sure to connect with us, stay tuned. Thank you very much and everybody stay safe.